Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to our Authors at Talk today on the Civil War as you should have learned it. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce a very good friend of mine, Christopher Oates, who we went to college and graduate school together. Um, Chris graduated magna cum laude from Brown with a degree in political science and classics in 2007. Um, earned a master's degree in international relations from Oxford and is currently working on his PhD at Oxford. Um, he's here now to talk to you about the Civil War. Um, in 2007, he published his first book, Fighting for Home, uh, the story of Alfred K. Oates and the 5th Regiment of South Street Brigade about his great-great-grandfather's experience in the Civil War. Here's Chris Oates. Um, well, thanks, Tasha. Um, thanks all you guys for coming here, taking time out of your day. And I guess if you're watching this online, thanks for you know procrastinating with us. Um, I'm here to tell you very quickly, I've got about 45 minutes, the Civil War, um, as you should have learned it, I think you'll find that it's much more important than you ever were taught in school, and I, I can guarantee that you'll probably be more entertained than you ever were in school. And uh, I'm, also, I'm here also because I want to sell books. Um, <laughs> home, I'll just lay out my cards. Um, I've got some books in the back, and then I've got a website, fightingforhome.blogspot.com. So if you're watching this, there should be a link over here, that little info box. Um, and the way it got started is that it is my, it's largely based on letters from my great, great, great grandfather. He came from England when he was 12, uh, signed up for the Union Army when he was 25, wrote a bunch of letters home, and then about 100 of those have been saved. And when I was 11 years old, I can still remember this, I was coming home from the batting cages with my dad, and I was telling him all about the Civil War. I must have read like a book on it earlier that day. You know how kids are, like they read something, they just have to tell everyone about it. Like, I mean, a lot's changed for me since then. Um, I don't still <laughs> talk about it. Um, but my dad mentioned, like, I think we have some Civil War stuff in my sister's attic. And so, you know, yeah, so we called her up, she came over, and it was a, a black leather pouch, a hundred letters, yellowed and laminated. Um, and this is the book, and that's, that's the info for it. And here are some of the letters. Uh, that we think is Alfred Oates from another thing we found. And you can tell just amazing, colorful letterheads. The penmanship is incredible. And then sitting down to read this, these letters, the, the stories in them were just fascinating. One letter describes the execution of a number of deserters. And you can just, you can feel them come in, they're standing on their coffins so that they just fall backwards into them when they get shot. Uh, it talks about trading tobacco and coffee with uh, the Confederates across a river, um, ball games and camps, and then, uh, so I was reading these letters and I got interested in the Civil War, and over the next few years I just kind of kept learning about the Civil War. It was just a hobby, I would read books, I would read a letter, he mentioned a battle, I'd go get a book from the library about that battle. And then, summer before my senior year in high school, I just decided I was going to write a book on it. My, my logic was, I'll probably write a book on it someday, and I might as well do it now to get it on my college application. <laughs> so, so I started on it, and it wasn't, to be honest, it wasn't that good. It was like a dry military history, and it was, it was okay. But then I got to Brown University, and I worked with a professor, and he kept telling me, you know, more Alfred Oates, more Alfred Oates. This is the guy that's interesting. He's a compelling character. So I wrote that, so it's supposed to appeal to you know, history buffs, the unit he was in, the Excelsior Brigade, was one of the hardest fighting of the war, one of the most famous at the time, but there hasn't been anything written on them in over a century. And uh, if you're just a casual reader, I think it's still a good story. This is a very compelling character. Uh, what he goes through is, I think, very interesting. And I've tried to set it up so that each chapter is kind of a new topic, a new theme, so that if you read it, you get some sense of what it was like to be a soldier fighting in the Civil War. Now, I, I came here today, and I'm, I'm saying that you you, this is the civil wars you should have learned it, implying you didn't learn it the right way uh, back in, in high school. And I think that this is the most rep misrepresented event in our nation's history. And as I was reading about it and learning about it for the purposes of the book, I really came to believe that because what I was learning about with the letters and with uh, the outside research I was doing was not really what I learned in school. I mean, even if you go to a great school and you have a great history teacher, as I was fortunate enough to do, and that's so that my old teachers are watching this online. I want to say, you did a great job. But you still taught it in the, you know, the curriculum that the advanced placement exam kind of helps, you know, forces you into or suggests. Uh, you're probably going to learn the social history of, of the war, you know, how it affected women, blacks, immigrants, other groups, the political history, so what President Lincoln did, what Congress did, the Supreme Court, and maybe the economic history, you know, how did it affect the agricultural self, the industrialization of the North, and uh, you know, maybe the developments of the railroads. And if you're lucky, some military history, battles and generals, and that sort of thing. But you never get an understanding of the central theme of the war. There's never that 
why was it fought? You know, what is the overarching thing that, you know, besides just the battles and the social groups and what the president did, what was the, what was the reason why this country went to war with itself? And I think it's misrepresented, and I say the most misrepresented in our nation's history, because we probably all think we know that. We already, we think we know the answer of why was the Civil War fought. Like, if I asked you, you know, what, what was the reason for the Civil War? When you think Civil War, what's the one thing you think about? Slavery. 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 Absolutely wrong. It was not <laughs> about slavery. I mean, this is something that I, I started to find in, you know, when I was reading these letters, and I think it's understandable that we all assume it's about slavery because it generally divided free states versus slave states. And when you're learning about history, you learn it chronologically. And slavery was without a doubt the biggest political issue in this country for the 40 years previously. I mean, you're, you go to school and you learn, you, know, you do the revolution and the constitution, and then you start getting into crisis after crisis about slavery. The, uh, the Missouri Compromise in 1820 about how to admit a state, should it be free state, slave state, uh, the Dred Scott judgment as a slave, a legally property or a person, the Fugitive Slave Acts, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and then culminating with the election of 1860 when President Lincoln was elected, and during which slavery was the single biggest issue. I mean, I would say it was really the only important issue in that presidential election. So you read all about those crises, and then you read about the Civil War, and you just assume it's, it's got to be about slavery. But I was... During my reading, and, and what's mentioned in the book, are a couple examples that indicate it wasn't at all about slavery. Uh, one of the letters is from Alfred K. Oates, and he's talking about the Emancipation Proclamation. And that was a bill that Lincoln signed. It was about two years into the war. And it said that all slaves in Confederate-held territories were now free. But Confederate-held territories is a very big qualifier. So slaves in the slave states that had not seceded, Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri, were not affected. Slaves in territory ca already captured by the Union, not affected. So it was only directed at the areas over which Lincoln had no direct authority. So it was certainly a symbolic uh, victory for the anti-slavery movement, and, but it was designed as a military measure. If you cut out the slave power of the South, that's a large uh, portion of their manpower, maybe some slaves will escape, maybe they'll stop working as hard, and then you start to sap the enemy's strength. So that's a, that's a big thing to remember. The Emancipation Proclamation was originally a military measure. And this is what one soldier, uh, reflecting his, his friends, wrote home about it. That bill that President Lincoln passed has turned our patriotism. And if I had my will, I would not fire my gun. If by firing, it would save the Union. We look on the war with indifference and do not care one pin. He, was, he wanted to quit the Army when he found out about the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's a very paradoxical thing when you realize that Alfred Oates was very much against slavery. In all of his letters, he is negative about slavery as an institution. The people who were connected with it on the slave-owning side, he is extremely negative to. He calls one of them the most hatefulest man I've ever met, uh, a, a man who used to catch fugitive, fugitive slaves as a living. And whenever he mentions slaves or freed slaves, he's very sympathetic. So, that got me thinking, why is it that an anti-slavery person who's fighting in the Civil War, which I always thought was about slavery, why does he want to quit and go home and let the Union break up because of the Emancipation Proclamation? So I did some, some more reading and I started to, to understand that you really need to understand the political landscape of the times beyond just free state slave slave. In the North, in the free states, they did not like slavery, but they also did not like abolitionists because abolitionists were, were a very small fraction of the population. They were against slavery almost single-mindedly. Some might say obsessively. Most men in the North, and men were the only ones that could vote um, at the time, they were against slavery, but they were also political moderates. So they thought, you know, let's, let's end slavery, but let's not do it right away. Let's certainly not push our country into a war over it. It's just not that important. And they thought the abolitionists, by stirring things up, by threatening um, you know, immediate ab abolition of slavery, they were gonna alienate the South. And over the previous 40 years, when those crises that I mentioned happened, the South had always made it clear, you try to abolish slavery, we might secede. It wasn't in a direct threat, but it was just, they knew that was the possibilities. And the people in the North saw the abolitionists and the secessionists as the same thing. They were radicals who were staking out their positions and who would drive the country to war rather than lose their positions. So when the war started, there was 
a fear. I mean, I don't think it was a big fear, but there was a sentiment in the North that a concern that this might be an abolitionist plot, that these abolitionists with Abraham Lincoln at their head forced the South to secede, trigger, triggering a war during which they would abolish slavery. And in so doing, have hundreds of thousands of men join the army, possibly die, to further their political agenda. And when the Emancipation Proclamation came out, I believe that Alfred Oates saw this and saw this as evidence that that rumor was true. Now, he cooled down a couple weeks afterwards, and I think once they processed what it truly was, they, they were fine with it. But there was that, that fear. And just one other example, in one chapter of the book, um, it's an event, a recruiting event in New York City. And uh, it's one of my favorite chapters, because you're in a big political hall, and it's a rally, and there's patriotic speeches to get men to join up. And one man stands up, and he shouts out, General, if you will only get the President of the United States to declare that this is not a war to put down slavery in the states where it exists, you will get 500,000 men in the North, implying that this fear that is actually about slavery is holding men back from joining up. Now, I don't think there was much truth to that, because Alfred Oates clearly had that fear, but he still joined up. Um, but it, it said to me that it certainly was not about slavery. It certainly wasn't about freeing the slaves. I mean, the thought that millions of men would leave their homes and risk their lives to free those they never met, that's extreme selfish, selflessness that I've never seen in political history. Um, and it also wasn't about the institution of slavery. So that got me thinking, if it's not about freeing the slaves, if it's not even about slavery, what could it possibly be? What could be more important than the biggest political issue of the previous 40 years? So I, I read a bit more and I, you know, studied it to, to try to find this out, and I came across a quote by Abraham Lincoln that I think sums it up perfectly. Uh, he says that the central idea pervading this struggle is the necessity that is upon us of providing that popular government is not an absurdity. We must settle this question now, whether in a free government the mi minority have the right to break up the government whether they choose. If we fail, it will go far to prove the incapability of the people to govern themselves. What was truly at stake in the Civil War, at least from the Northern perspective, is the possibility that democracy could actually work in the real world, that you could actually have a country without a king or a czar or an emperor, and it would stay together. Because the fear, and this goes back to the, the central dilemma of the Constitutional Convention. I mean, if you think back to your history about the Constitution, um, all the checks and balances, the divide between the House and the Senate, the legislative branch and the presidential, the different election years, was all to try to figure out how to keep a democracy stable so that some sort of mob passion wouldn't overthrow it um, so that some dictator wouldn't come up, but also it said it wouldn't break up. Because what if there was a, a big issue that people cared passionately about and thought, you know, for me, this issue, the majority want to do this, that'll affect me badly. It's better for me to just leave the country. And that had been a concern uh, throughout this time, I mean, the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, that was over, I believe it was alcohol taxes, and the people past the Appalachian Mountains felt that it, it hurt them, and they tried to have a rebellion. George Washington put it down, it was the only time when a president actually fought a battle. Um, there was the Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts over tax. New England actually thought about secession during the War of 1812, which they thought hurt their commerce. So the Civil War, and the issue of slavery as a political issue, but not really the cause, was made that the civil made the civil war an example of whether democracy could exist. I mean, democracy was not the was not a, the main system of government at the time. In 1860, most of the world was run by a king or was part of a colony. Uh, France had actually tried to have a democracy twice. They had tried a republic two times, and both times ended up with Napoleon on the throne. So. Across the world, well, across Europe, all democratic reformers had to point to as a successful democracy was the United States. Every, everyone else would say, you know, it, it won't work, it can't work, you need that king. And so Lincoln saw the Civil War as the test of whether a democracy could stick together. Because if the South could secede, the Midwest could, New England could, the states could break up from each other. And then maybe, maybe democracy would fade away in certain states, and probably it would fade away in the rest of the world. So I say that the Civil War is more important than you ever imagined, not to, not to say that the issue of slavery was not important. I mean, it affected millions of people. The fact that 
it was abolished after the war was you know, a huge impact on the world. But the fact that this, the North won the Civil War and proved that democracy could exist and could actually work, I mean, that set the, set the stage for democracy to take over the rest of the world. Most of the countries in the world nowadays are democracies. And so, whereas slavery affects millions, the Civil War as a test of democracy affected billions. And that's why I think it's important. But there's something else that we don't learn in school um, when we do the socio-political economic history. And that's the fact that the people who lived through those times were real people. They weren't just names in a book. And I know we, I mean, obviously we know that, but knowing it intellectually is a lot different from actually kind of realizing it with a, something from those, those people. And the Civil War, just as I think slavery, the, the thought that we know it's about slavery hurts us from finding the true story, I think the letters that we do often see in popular culture prevent us from finding the full story. Because the typical Civil War letter that you'll see on a documentary or a TV show are generally the ones with the soldiers at war and he's writing home to his wife saying why he's fighting, you know, maybe he's scared of death, but uh, he hopes that his family, if he dies, knows why he fought and, and knows why he, he believes so much in this cause. And those are important letters, and the one that's in the Ken Burns documentaries is an amazing one. I recommend you all, you know, watch that documentary. But, and, and that's in the book as well, that sort of thing. But it's not, they didn't do, they didn't sit around talking for three years, every second of every day, about just how patriotic they were and how willing to die. I mean, that'd get a little repetitive after a while. And we often don't get the letters that show the full side of the war. The fact that these people, while patriotic, had their own daily dramas or ambitions or opportunities that they tried to get. And that's really what I tried to bring across in the book. The fact that these soldiers would, would fight a battle, many of them would die, the survivors would not just think that they're alive, but they would check the newspapers to see what their media coverage was. And some of the letters <laughs> were, you know, ranting, um, you know, I can't believe the hometown paper said the 123rd Regiment fought. They didn't have, their fingers were completely clean, no gunpowder on them. We fought, we didn't get a mention. Like, that sort of thing, the daily life, what actually goes on for these men, that is, is missed. And we get a very narrow view of what these soldiers uh, did. So, for the, the last 20 minutes of this talk, instead of going a snapshot of what, you know, uh, what, they, what they did, I'm just going to tell you one story. And it's the first chapter of my book. Um, I, I, in my mind, it's about the, the most interesting general of the Civil War, or at least the most interesting man who ever got to the rank of general. And the hope is that if you like this story, you'll get the book because there's a lot more in it. So the man that I'm talking about, his name is Daniel Edgar Sickles. And uh, <laughs> there he is, handsome man. And this guy is, I mean, he is amazing. So let's just, let's just start out, go back. He's born in 1819. Uh, his dad was a lawyer, so middle class. His family was descended from the Dutch that had colonized Manhattan. So, you know, solid middle class, maybe even upper middle class family. He was apprenticed as a printer, which is very solid member of society. Printers were often news, uh, the editors of their own newspapers in those days. Attended what would become New York University, NYU, and then was admitted to the bar in 1846. Um, he started practicing law before he passed the bar exam. Um, <laughs> that's going to be a trend you'll find whenever he does something. <laughs> yeah there'll be just a slight touch of corruption to it. Um, but he's an ambitious man. He is a, you know, he's a charismatic man. You can see from that photo, uh, relatively <laughs> handsome guy. God, I so. Nice mustache. Um, and he gets started into politics. He's ambitious. And politics in New York City in the mid-1800s means Tammany Hall. They control the Democratic Party, and the Democrats control the city. Now, whenever you've ever heard about urban political corruption, so graft, kickbacks, votes for favors, you know, electoral fraud. Tammany Hall set the gold standard for this. <laughs> nothing, nothing in Chicago ever came close to what Tammany could do. And if you saw the movie Gangs of New York, um, the, the guy, I, I can't remember the actor's name, but he was the father in the Bridget Jones movies. He, he, his character in Gangs of New York was the boss of Tammany Hall. And they show scenes, and this actually happened, immigrants would come off the boat, they would get maybe a roof over their heads. Tammany would help them find a, you know, find a job. And all they asked for in return, the, the very kind people at Tammany, were their votes on election day. Maybe their votes a few times. Maybe the votes of their friends. Maybe the votes of the recently deceased. <laughs> if, it was a, if there was a name on the, on the rolls, 
Tammany was going to get their vote. Um, all, all, the, all the political machines operate the same way. So James Michael Curley in Boston, Richard Daly, the elder, in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, basically, it was, it was the same thing, but Tammany was the best. They were the most outrageous. So Dan Sickles joins Tammany Hall, and he moves up very quickly. I mean, you can see 1853, Council to the City, same year serves at the Embassy in London. Uh, the ambassador at that time would be, was James Buchanan, who was president before Lincoln. Uh, then New York State Senate, very quickly elected to U.S. Congressman. So very rapid rise. I mean, he was an ambitious man. He was a talented man. But he, wherever he went, even in his professional rise that took him from council to congressman in four years, scandals always followed him. I mean, he just couldn't get away with them. First one being his marriage. And when your marriage is a scandal, you know that something, something's been different. <laughs> so this is Teresa Bagioli, his wife. I don't know which one is the more lifelike. <laughs> I hope for his sake it's the one of the right. <laughs> He's a handsome man. But he married Teresa in 1852, just before he came to the city council. And it was a big scandal in the state. Now, she was also a member of society. Her grandfather uh, had written the librettos for Mozart's operas. Her father uh, was a music teacher in New York City, and she actually grew up speaking five languages. She was a very intelligent girl. But the marriage was against the wishes of both families. So it's just strange when you think that the families were very good family friends. Sickles was friends with her father, until the details start to come out. First of all, Therese was pregnant at the time of her marriage, probably the cause of the marriage. Dan Sickles, well, he was 33 at the time, and Teresa was 16. Um, and, he, and even in the 19th century, that was not so great, um, even when they married young. And then finally, and this is just a rumor, but I really have to say it because with Dan Sickles, you never know. <laughs> it was said that a couple of years earlier, Dan had had an affair with Teresa's mother. <laughs> so huge fan of Dan Sickles afterwards. I mean, first his wife, now his daughter. Um, but they get married, and, and they have a, a, a baby, and... Dan begins his uh, political career, but again, the scandals keep coming. When he was a state senator, he was censured for bringing a prostitute onto the floor of the Senate. <laughs> they, they were not allowed on the tours. He then takes the same prostitute on an official trip to England, presents her to Queen Victoria, and as the prostitute's name, gives the name of one of his political opponents. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest, I've, I've, actually, I've studied this, I've tried to figure out, you know, my, I do, did political science, what he was going for, I don't really know. I think it was just him having fun with his political opponent. He knew it was, the story was going to come out. But all of this is the minor leagues for Dan Sickles. This is just warming up to one of the big scandals of his life, the Philip Barton Key affair. I don't say it's the biggest because he later was rumored to have had an affair with the Queen of Spain, the <laughs> ambassador, but this was definitely number two at least. So Dan Sickles, it's 1857. He's won election to Congress from, as a representative from New York State. He travels down to Washington and immediately comes in with uh, you know, Washington society. He is a charismatic man from the largest city in the country, and his wife is a beautiful 20-year-old who speaks five languages. So they go and they, they get into society and they make quite a few friends, and Philip Barton Key was one of them. Uh, he was a U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia. His father wrote the Star Spangled Banner, and his uncle was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So, solid member of Washington society. He is a handsome man. Again, mustache. Back in those days, they were amazing. Uh, <laughs> he and Dan Sickles become really great friends, even to the point where Dan Sickles entrusts Philip to take Teresa to all the balls and parties that she has to attend whenever Dan Sickles is busy, either with you know official work or you know a prostitute of his own. <laughs> um, this was not such a great idea because. In, during the winter of 1858 to 1859, this is after Dan Sickles has won re-election, before he's uh, sworn into his second term, Philip Barton Key and Teresa begin an affair of their own. Soon become the talk of the capital. Everyone knows about it, except for Dan Sickles. It even gets to the point where Philip Key rents out a house on 15th Street, I think in the Northwest Quadrant, uh, as a love nest for him and Teresa. And it was not in a very good part of town, as you can probably tell from this drawing, you know, chick, uh, dogs or something. But, you know, it's not, it's not a great section of town. But Phil Key rented it out. And it was just, it was the talk of Washington society. That ends uh, late February, just before Dan Sickles is sworn into his second term. He receives an anonymous note telling him of the affair. He was in the House of Representatives at the time. He goes into the cloakroom, brings a friend in who was the clerk, and he asks 
is this true? And he says it is. And Dan Sickles was reported to be distraught and actually weeping at this news. I mean, whatever his own indiscretions, he did not think that his wife would do this to him. So he goes home, he confronts Teresa, he forces her two days later to write a confession, um, conf handwritten confession about what she did. Uh, some of the things just says, um, I've been in a house on 15th Street with Mr. Key, how many times, I don't know. And then later, I've written this with my bedroom door open and my maid and child in the adjoining room, and bring the child into it, um, just to stress the fact that Teresa was a mother and she was having an affair. So Sickles doesn't know what to do. Um, this actually, this letter, just here it is. It was flashed on the cover of Harper's Weekly later, <laughs> <laughs> the biggest newspaper at the time. It was, it was the one of the few pieces of national media we had back then. A circulation of two hundred thousand. Um, each copy, you can assume, was passed around a number of times. So a sizable proportion of the population read Teresa's confession later on. And the reason that this became a big deal, the reason that Harper's Weekly eventually got this, is because the next day came. Dan Sickles is in his house. Uh, it's on Lafayette Square, which if you know Washington, D.C., is right next to the White House. Um, he was sitting there. He had a couple friends over, political advisors, trying to figure out what to do with this whole thing. And he looks out the window, and who does he see but Philip Barton Key. Key had had, uh, we think, had a rendezvous with Teresa planned. She didn't show up. She was you know, locked in, in her bedroom with her maid and her child. Um, he, you know, she didn't show up, he goes over to Lafayette Square, and he's actually standing in the square outside of their house with a white handkerchief <laughs> signaling to Teresa to get her attention. <laughs> Dan Sickles sees this, and whatever kind of passionate nature he had that made him cry when he heard about the affair, he just flips out. And he grabs two gu three guns, two <laughs> derringers and a revolver, and he storms out the house. And Philip Key is a U.S. attorney, he's no dummy. He, sees Dan Sickles with the guns, <laughs> figures out the jig is up, and starts running. Dan Sickles chases after him through Lafayette Square, I mean, shouting. One of the things that he was reported to say, I don't know if this was a reconstruction, is, uh, Key, you scoundrel, you have disgraced my home, you must die. <laughs> <laughs> he fires at him. He grazes him with his first shot. Fires at him again. He hits it, uh, Philip Key in the groin. Key's now on the ground <laughs> in Lafayette Square. He's crawling. He's actually begging for his life against this madman who's running at him with a gun. Dan Sickles chases after him. They think Key crawled to under a tree, was sitting there kind of like propped up, begging for his life. Dan Sickles fought, aims at him. He pulls the trigger, and it's a misfire. <laughs> now, if it was a movie, maybe the cops would rush in, or he would you know, come to his senses, or things, whatever. But this isn't a movie. So he takes the next gun, points <laughs> at him, pulls the trigger, boom. Hits Philip Key in the chest. As Dan Sickles turns to go home, a United States attorney, his uncle is the Chief Justice, is bleeding to death in Lafayette Park in broad daylight, about 200 yards from the White House. <laughs> so, as you can imagine, Dan Sickles eventually turns himself into the Attorney General, but it becomes the biggest trial of the century. And so Harper's Weekly got the confession. They also made a lithograph of what they assumed to be the affair. And I just want to I just want to take one second to point out. <laughs> oh, I did, yes. <laughs> yeah. well, like, well, the illustrators thought, oh, I need a passerby, so I'll just have a guy coolly, you know, <laughs> like, a spiked iron fence, just leaning my elbow on it, watching the dude get murdered. <laughs> just, you know, just, hey, honey, what was, how was your day? Oh, nice, took a walk, so I gotta get murdered, no big deal. Uh, my elbow's all thrown up. Um, <laughs> so it became a trial. The biggest trial of the year, almost oh, certainly the biggest trial of the decade. Um, Daniel Sickles, United States Congressman, killing a man in broad daylight. But Dan Sickles, as I said, he is ambitious, he is charismatic, and he is not going to let a little thing like a murder <laughs> solve, you know, slow him up. Um, so he gets as his lawyer, Edwin Stanton, <laughs> one of the best attorneys in the country, later would be the Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln. So a very smart man. They devise a strategy. First of all, they plead not guilty by means of temporary insanity, which was a first in American jurisprudence. <laughs> I would have never had temporary insanity. But really what they did was they realized this was a celebrity trial, and so they built it on character. Dan Sickles, you know, he was only, he was an upstanding man. He was defending his home, he was defending his honor. The real criminal here was Philip Key. The evil Philip Key with his house in the bad section of town, tempting the innocent Teresa out of marital bliss. <laughs> 
into a life of sin. You know, that was the real crime here. And so they do this the entire trial, and as you can see, it's covered in the media. I mean, people were following this. The, I'm sure the arguments were printed out in the, the newspapers of the day. And so the verdict comes. It's not guilty, of course. And the verdict comes to a cheering courtroom. We're all wildly in favor of Dan Sickles. Now, he should have been at the peak of his career right now. He was a nationally known figure, very popular. He had uh, defended his home, you know, a Victorian gentleman, uh, defending his honor. But then he did something, and I don't think Dan Sickles, the wily politician, realized what effect this would have. He made a mistake right after the trial. Teresa came to him and she asked for forgiveness, and he gave it to her. And now all of a sudden the coin turned, because Teresa, wasn't she the one who her sins had caused a man to die, caused Sickles to go through this terrible ordeal, cost New York one of their congressmen for a large part of, the, of 1859. And all of a sudden, I think either Sickles or Tammany Hall or the folks in his district realized, you know, if you take the people who are now aghast that he forgave his wife, the people who still never got over the fact that he killed a man, and then those who just didn't like him anyway, Dan Sickles was not winning re-election. So 1860 comes, he's not re-elected to another term. And when, Dan, when Abraham Lincoln comes into Washington in March of 1861, uh, Dan Sickles is on a, on a train back to New York City. He's in political exile. I mean, he's a, a politician that no one, no one likes. But then something <laughs> happens that I don't think Sickles knew what effect this would have. The Civil War happens. Now the story of how, I'm running out of time, but the story of how Dan Sickles became the general in command of the Excelsior Brigade, it's a great story, it's, oh. it's in the book, I don't have time to say it now, but it involves upstate New York versus New York City, Democrats, Republicans in the Senate, um, state versus federal bureaucracy, and it ends up with a scandal involving President Lincoln, Mary Todd Lincoln, the White House gardener, <laughs> and an undercover newspaper reporter who had previously been a spy for England and France. Um, or at least that's, it's involved there. Yeah, basically, the, the former spy was a kind of a European version of Dan Sickles. Um, now, that, the fact is that Dan Sickles, because he was in exile, had to do something big. When the Civil War came along, he had to, to recruit men, because, I mean, he's no longer congressman, and what's the only thing really better than being a congressman, and that's being a, uh, a general. So he wanted to be a general. So he puts all of his efforts in 1861 into recruiting men later into the political battles to get himself to command them. Now I mentioned this, this story and why it's part of the Civil War that you should have learned. Because the fact that this man was a politician and ambitious and that his career was ruined is I think 90% of why he, laid, he recruited a brigade. He was a patriotic man. I think that comes through that he actually did care about the country, but he was also a very ambitious man. And the brigade he formed, which my great-great-great-grandfather fought in, uh, fought in about 20 battles. They did very well, certainly made a contribution to the Union war effort. So the fact that a murder trial impacted 5,000 men fighting for their country is something that we don't learn. And some, we don't realize the, the daily dramas and ambitions that actually go into a national struggle like the Civil War. But, uh, and then, this is, this is what happened in the end. The Excelsior Brigade was called after Dan Sickles. Um, that the, the fact that a, a murderer became kind of the patron of 5,000 Union soldiers. Um, but I mention this not just because it's an interesting story, and I hope you had you know, enjoyed hearing about it and want to hear more so you get my book. I say it because the two parts of my talk today are connected. The fact is, the Civil War is more important than we ever thought about. And also, it can be more entertaining than we ever learned. And I think that's very, the connection uh, between them is very, very big. Because I read about the Civil War and I started in it because of the letters I got from my ancestor. And I read them because they were interesting. And I kept reading them because they were interesting. And so that I could better figure them out, I read more about the Civil War. And I read other books and I read you know, the more difficult books about the political and economic situation. So it was the fact that it was entertaining that led me to the importance. I, cert I would never have stayed with it long enough to get to the understanding of the Civil War as democracy's testing ground if it hadn't been for the letters I got and for stories like this murder trial. 
And that's something that we don't get in our history classes today. We're, we don't give the, the human dramas, we don't give the entertaining value that history can be. And so we don't give kids the incentive to keep on reading outside of school. And obviously we can't do it for every student, for every era. But if we start to do it more, and if we start to show them why it can be fun to read about history, I think that will lead them to understand why it's important. And will lead them to things that they wouldn't just get um, even if they got a perfect on their AP exam. So that is, I think, the fact that entertainment and historical importance can go together is the Civil War as you should have learned it. And I'll take any questions that you have. Yes? Your thesis is that the um, Civil War is about preserving a, a national government that is, you know, not like royalty or devolves into something where people split apart. Right. Not, I mean, certainly like other factors were very important, right. but I think that's the overall. Okay. Um, given that, do you, how would you interpret the last part of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address where he says, government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth? Do you have any comments about that? Because I've always wondered what the heck he really means by that. You can interpret it as people, you know, um, all of the people versus just white people. But in terms of a national government, do you have any feeling about what that means? I mean, I had just read that as kind of a stand-in for the Constitution and the democratic system of government, which they felt would fail if the Union as a unified country failed. I mean, that, that's what I interpreted it as. If the Union divides itself, then democracy will start to perish, not just in America, but across the world. I mean, I, I just saw it as rhetoric. I didn't think it was anything more. I, I might be wrong. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I would answer that. I mean, it's, it's because at, at the time the U.S. was not strong, and uh, if the if the U.S. were really to break up in half, it would be vulnerable to foreign powers playing one off the other. Foreign powers which are not interested in democracy, and that's that's what Lincoln had. I'm glad you brought up the Gettysburg Address because I I, I kind of don't agree with the thesis you're making. There's there's two points of disagreement. The first is you said that you sort of discovered this by reading the letters that. A lot of people were more focused on preserving democracy rather than uh, eliminating slavery, but that's not anything buried at all. I mean, it's it is the it's the meat of the Gettysburg Address. I mean, that that is the thesis right. that Lincoln talks about. He just I don't believe he mentioned slavery in the Gettysburg Address. Right. It was very overt. I mean, that's but, that's but true. But when you read when you learn about it in school, you often learn slavery is the Civil War. That's what right. I was talking well, about. That's the second point of disagreement I had with you. I mean, I I feel like I'm the only one that still thinks the Civil War was about slavery. Every time people comment on the Civil War in the media, they're always saying that, oh, the conventional wisdom is it was about slavery, but actually it wasn't. Well, actually, everybody says that. I mean, this, this, this is what I hear all commentators about the Civil War saying. And in my opinion, the only way you can accept this thesis is if you just ignore all the evidence that speaks against it. Look, look at the declarations of independence of the individual states. Look at what they said their reasons for, for seceding were. They were very overt that they wanted to establish a white supremacist state. That's what they wrote. Um, and also about democracy. Um, the, the Confederacy was also a democracy, actually. I mean, it was not, they, they, were, not, they were not nominating a king. Well, on um, that, I, 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 I'm not, I mean, I'm not an expert on the South. Um, um, I know that slavery was much more important to them. I always saw slavery in the South as the issue that led into what they thought as a perceived political disenfranchisement. I think for them, the, the election of Lincoln, they already were in the minority in the House. They, I think, were minority in the Senate. And now they lost. The president was against slavery. I thought for them, slavery was the issue that showed from here on out, the South was going to be voted down time and again in Washington. So it's better for them to get out of the country so they can have a say. Um, yeah. um, I, I, I think the two different things are being said here. On the one hand, it's certainly true that the South seceded because they wanted to maintain slavery. I mean, after the Dred Scott decision, there were people in the South saying, oh, we're going to open a slave market on Boston Commons. So they envisioned not only having slavery, but extending it into the North. I think it's also valid to say, especially based on the letters that you have and the comments about people writing at the time, that a majority of the people in the North did not see the fight as being about slavery. They were uncomfortable with that. Okay, a lot of them saw the fight as not necessarily being about slavery, eliminating slavery, as being about preserving the union. 
I mean, and, and Lincoln certainly did not go into office saying, I'm going to eliminate slavery. So it's, it, you have to be clear that it's not the North stood up and said, we're going to get rid of slavery and stop this, and thereby stop the South. It's more Lincoln said, we're going to preserve the Union, and the South gave as their reason for leaving, we're going to maintain slavery. So it's a, it, I think the, the premise that it's a lot more complicated than saying somebody in the North decided it's time to get rid of slavery, that, that's a good premise. And, and what you said about slavery being a very big issue for the South, I think, I mean, that's, it's absolutely true that it was. What Lincoln was, was talking about, I think, is that there are always going to be very important issues to groups of people. And you have to make sure in a democracy for it to, to last that even the folks that lose out on a specific issue don't leave the country. Because, I mean, as I said, New England almost, they talked about secession during the War of 1812, which they felt hurt uh, commerce with Britain, because we had a war with Britain. And, um, and so, you know, it was hurting their interests. So I think it was that at any given point in time, there's going to be a, a big issue. Maybe not something as big as slavery again. And I certainly think slavery is why it was between the states that it was in 1860. But for Lincoln, it was about the, the general idea that even a political issue can't, doesn't divide a country uh, into two different countries. And I, th I think you see this, like, today with the healthcare debate, too. I mean, I think a lot of people react to you know, like the imposition of some sort of health care program as even though a president was elected, the, that it's still some, some sort of abrogation of democracy. And, and it's, an important, it's an important issue and, and people feel that because their voice isn't the one that's being represented, that democracy is somehow being sacrificed. Not commenting on the validity of that position at all, I think it's, it's not something that's gone away. This, this sense that, you know, like this is so important to me that, you know, screw democracy. I mean, it's... it's a lot of democracies have split up. I mean, Yugoslavia split up over, uh, well, it wasn't a democracy, but you know, a lot of countries have split up over specific issues. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not unlikely that it might happen. Yeah, well, I mean, democracy is a corrupted republic anyway. I mean, if you look at, if you look at Aristotle's tree of governments, I mean, it's actually uh, essentially majority rule. It's not really the kind of thing that you want. It's mob rule. Yeah, um, it's two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, are you, are you, you're right. I mean, back in the back in that time, they talked much more in terms of the republic and preserve the republic. Nowadays, we talk about democracy, and we have implicit the idea of checks and balances. So that's why I use the term democracy through it, just because that's what you know the, we think of. Um, yeah. But yeah, they they did. Lincoln talked about preserving the republic and prever preserving popular government. He didn't use ever use the term democracy. Suppose it could devolve into a healthcare debate. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's a. I think you've made an excellent point, though, because it, it's the whole thing is very complex, and you can't can't simply say that it is slavery, and you can't simply say that it isn't. I mean, I thought about this a lot, and I think you know, if slavery if slavery had not been an issue, there might not have been any other issue really to divide the the sections of states. On the other hand, it was how are we going to resolve this that, that was the primary cause of the Civil War. A lot of people thought, okay, it's worth doing this because we want to preserve the Union, and then they, they eventually changed to seeing that this was a way of getting beyond the issue of slavery, which had always been hanging over the country. And that there's still a debate. You know, I mean, nobody's going to be able to answer something, especially since none of the people that, that were debating it at the time are alive anymore. In your research, did you find, because I always thought that it was about slavery, but not in terms of a moral good or bad of an economic system, and that the North was winning economically, and mm -hmm. the South had always been more powerful, and they wanted to secede because they thought they were going to use it economically. Um, and then if they got rid of slavery, with the votes, they destroy the South economy. I mean, that probably was important. I, I never came across that. I came across the South thinking that slavery needed to expand westward, or else it would eventually, you know, wither and die. I think that's the terms they use. And the North not wanting to let it expand westward, and that was that was actually the main debate in the election that Lincoln was was fought whether slavery would expand westward, and he came down on no, it's not going to expand at all, uh, and. Those in the South who were against, very much against Lincoln, thought, well, if he won't let it expand west, next thing he's going to do is eliminate where it already exists. And that's why um, the, the man that stood up at the political rally said, 
get Lincoln to say it's not about putting down slavery where it already exists. I think most people in the North were agreed that it shouldn't expand. That's why they voted for Lincoln. But they weren't about to start a war to put it down where it already was. And what was their main reason for why they, the North didn't want it to expand? I think the idea of the frontier was very important back then. The fact that you know if it gets too crowded in the East, a man can always go. A white man can always go west and find new land. And that if you have slavery in the West, then you have the system of a, a you know a plantocrat or an aristocrat with thousands of slaves taking up the land from the humble you know middle class white men who would have had that. I think that's a good point too. I mean, it's it the the, the whole dynamic is west versus east as much as it is north versus south. I mean, Lincoln represented the west. The Republicans represented the west. I mean, the, the first Republican candidate was John Fremont, who was Californian. So it was more the attitude of the westerners, which in those days was people from Iowa and Minnesota and things like that, who said, we want to have the, the life out, life further west be the same as what we, we have. Well, I learned I learned in high school about the economics side of it was that it was more of a conservative thing for the North, and that if they lost control of the South, then the South could trade directly with Europe and that sort of thing. And I mean, it would be in a much worse position. Yeah. In Atlanta. Yep. <laughs> um, the, the Europe is a, a big part. British. I, I go to school in Britain, so I read you know their history textbooks occasionally. They wanted to establish an informal empire in the South like what they had in Latin America at that time, where very favorable trade treaties that they were basically dictating. They tried to do it in the South, but they were defeated by the political power of Washington. And so that, that may be true, that the Southern tribes you know, would want to trade. And that's actually the way the, the North beat them, is to cut off the Southern uh, trade routes. That's actually why cotton is grown in Egypt today, because the Brits couldn't get cotton from the South, so they planted in, uh, in Egypt, where they already had a colony. So that is one of the reasons why the South was much very poor after the war, is that their main commodity, they had lost the market on it. And that might be why those people in Atlantis are still bitter about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. This has been great. Um, I have one more question. Yes. Does your book attempt to explain what the heck General Sickles was doing on the second day of Gettysburg? Um, <laughs> No, uh, sort of not really. Basically, in Gettysburg, um, the Union was, it was called the fish hook, so basically it was one big line. Dan Sickles was at the end, and he marched out pretty far. Um, and that's what got attacked, and it got driven back. And uh, if it wasn't for the fighting on the round troughs, which was in the movie Gettysburg, Joshua Chamberlain, they say the Union might have lost Gettysburg. The previous battle to that, which was Chancellorsville, Dan Sickles had the experience of being in the low ground and having the Confederates occupy the high ground in front of him and then just shell him, you know, shell his lines to pieces. And at that bit of the Gettysburg ground, he was in a low bit. The whole line was supposed to be on a ridge, but where Sickles was, the ridge kind of died out. And in front of him was very high ground. He was afraid that the same thing would happen. Confederates would just walk up, get the high ground, shoot him, and then go. So he took the high ground, extending his lines, uh, directly contradicting a, an order from his superior. Um, but he later claimed that by taking it, even though his line was shattered and pushed back, he bought enough time for the Union to form troops. And that if he hadn't been pushed back to his original position, he would have been pushed back uh, into defeat. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> the guy was, I mean, he murdered someone, so. <laughs> but that's, yeah, it's mentioned in the book. I've uh, I finished reading the book uh, Confederates in the Attic. I don't know if you. I've heard of it. Yeah. That. Um, but it uh, goes into depth of modern perceptions of, of the Civil War from the Confederate standpoint. And I'm wondering how how do you perceive um, Civil War reenactments through like the lens of, of this novel, of sort of this of this book? Well, I I guess I did I saw some books at the Civil War reenactment. And you first, you kind of think, these guys are weird because they're dressing up and shooting off guns. But then you go there and you're like, they get to dress up and shoot off guns. <laughs> so it's really cool, actually. I, I recommend you, uh, you guys like attend one. Um, and it's, it's actually a lot of fun. I don't, I don't really, I can't go into like analysis of, of them. I haven't spent enough time. But I, mean, it's just gonna be part I just think it's kind of a, a, an interesting hobby that they have. And you know, it's better than sitting around watching TV. So huh, why not?
And they also buy a lot of books. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I really like you guys. <laughs> yeah. Is that a great? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.